This week, Conflict Zone is in the German city of Hamburg, and my guest is Jan van Aken, foreign affairs spokesman for the opposition left party. They are virulently anti-NATO, anti-arms sales, and anti the bombing of Syria. So what would they do to combat terrorism by the so-called Islamic State? Jan van Aken, welcome to Conflict Zone. Thank you. You said recently that you should talk to your enemies. Talk, 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 however brutal they are. Tell me what kind of conversation you'd have with Islamic State. None at all. There. Yeah. So your argument goes out the window straight away. Not at all. The, the, the point is, wherever the conflict is, whether it's the Taliban in Afghanistan, Assad in Syria, when the enemy is willing to talk, talk. And I think there were big mistakes concerning Assad. And there was a point where he was willing to concede when he was militarily weak. And then the West thought they were too strong to talk. There was a mistake. But Islamic State, I don't see anyone there willing to talk. So there's no point now. So your argument falls down. So what do you do? You fight them then? Yes, you fight them, but not militarily. You're, you're How? How then? I mean, there's first one thing that we have to learn from Afghanistan, no? I mean, for 13 years, everybody said, um, we have to fight them, we have to get rid of the Taliban, nobody can talk to them. And what happened? NATO failed. It was one of the biggest defeats of NATO in history. They went out, and now everybody's hoping for talks between the different factions in Afghanistan. And I think there's one lesson, that you cannot defeat a terrorist organization militarily, is a big lesson we have to so, learn. So you don't talk to them, you don't fight them. So what do you do? The biggest you're, you're good on what you don't do, but you're less good on what you do. No, I'm, I think I'm even better on what I'm doing. Because the big question nobody's asking is, what can you do today to weaken Islamic State? So one thing is the money side. So every time there's a big terrorist attack in Europe, that was a year ago, that was now after Paris, everybody says, oh, we have to fight their financial sources. So what happened is, earlier this year, I've been to Qatar, I was meeting there with a, with a German ambassador, we met the minister on, on talking about everything. And suddenly You're not going to cut off funding to Islamic State, because they won't, they won't cut the funding to Islamic yeah. State. But Everybody's using Islamic State for their own purposes exactly. in the Gulf, as you exactly. well know. But, so what is the purpose of German diplomacy if we are not able to put some pressure on the Arab states? I mean, the German diplomacy well, you're clearly is not, not, because the US can't do it, Europe, the EU can't do it, nobody's done you're giving me You're giving me three things that you can't do to beat Islamic State. Well, you're not right. giving me one that is going to have any effect. And the, the worst thing is that you're not going to protect the innocents. No, no, being, let's, let's, stop, being, let's stop it. You're making arguments raped, that are not right. Who are being raped, who are being beaten up, who are being enslaved, who are being beheaded, you don't want to protect them because you don't want to intervene. You're too fast. You are just claiming that there's no way of stopping Qatar funding ISIS. Who's saying this? I mean, who is bowing every day to Qatar? That's the German government, that's the French government. I think there's a point now in putting, in, in, yeah, putting up the pressure towards Qatar, towards Saudi Arabia, towards the Emirates, just going there, delivering weapons to these countries, and then hoping ISIS will go away. This is not a politics. Yeah, but easily said, because they've been under pressure to stop terrorist funding for the last 10, 15 years, who and it hasn't pressure? happened. Who put pressure on them? The EU and the US. Who? The I US. never saw this. The US. I, I never US. saw this. I'm telling if you, you If you story. read the State Department human rights reports, Year after year after year, go back 10 years, you'll find we had these discussions, we put this pressure on them, they're not stopping. So and what is Germany doing? Again. I'm, I'm a member of the German parliament, I know that Germany is doing nothing. The German ambassador in Qatar didn't even know who is the minister responsible in Qatar to go after the funding. They don't care at all. And therefore I'm not buying any but argument. They don't exactly advertise which minister is in charge of terrorist funding. He did. When I was there, he told me, I'm responsible for the religious foundations and looked at the ambassador. The ambassador didn't react. And, and how's your pressure going with them then? How's for that example, going? What results example, are you getting? I'm not the German government. I'm opposition. Okay. But you could start to put up some pressure. Just ignoring, just ignoring, just ignoring and just looking away and then saying, oh, we have a big problem with Islamic meanwhile, State. Meanwhile, people are being enslaved and beheaded. Exactly and have their human rights violated left, right and centre, and you're happy for that to go on. What is the price, Jan van Aken, of not intervening? Just as we didn't intervene 
in Rwanda, just as we haven't intervened in Sudan, just as we didn't intervene in the Congo. Millions of people are dead where nobody intervened. The price of not intervening is pretty high, isn't it? I'm totally with you, and therefore I'm asking to intervene, but not militarily. Intervening with the Qatari government to stop the funding with no money, ISIS will go very, very fast. The second point of getting away with funding for ISIS is stopping the oil smuggle. Everybody in Germany knows, and they gave it to me in writing, the German government, they know that the oil smuggling of ISIS goes through Barzani territory in northern Iraq and from there to Turkey. Nobody's doing anything because nobody wants to have a problem with Erdogan in Turkey. Nobody wants to have a problem with, with Barzani. So it's the German government that is not intervening on the financial sources of ISIS. And you think they this could will do be a overnight. great comfort to those who are waiting execution at the moment, that you're actually going to put a little pressure on, on them for their funding. That's, that's going to be a great comfort to them, sitting today in their jails, waiting to be beheaded. I'm totally with you, and this is the that's problem. That's not much comfort, They are it? sitting in the, in the jails, and the German government is doing nothing to defeat ISIS on the financial side, on the smuggle of weapons, on the smuggle of foreign fighters. The German government knows now for four years foreign fighters go through Turkey over the border to Syria to support um, ISIS. So what's and wrong with bombing their oil installations? It. What's wrong with bombing their oil installations? Because it's not efficient. Why still, not? ISIS has their, their oil installations. They still earn $200,000 a day by smuggling oil. Everybody knows where the root of the trucks is. So and bomb, doing bomb anything. them better. Bomb them better. Why isn't that an argument? Why just closing the borders? Isn't that much easier without bombs? So that's not going to be very effective, is it? But then you're, I don't understand... You're telling me all these me. things that are not going to be of any help whatsoever to these people who are enslaved and beheaded and have their rights taken away from them. It will help them immediately. Immediately. So the German government is being good friends with Erdogan, with Qatar, with Barzani, doing nothing to stop the financial support for ISIS not intervening on behalf of the poor people in, in, in Raqqa, for but example. But the German government is asking Turkey to take the refugee problem off them, you know, to outsource the refugee problem to, to Turkey. Please protect our borders. Please stop these people coming to Europe. So what leverage do you think German government has with Turkey? Dirty deal. Zero. Dirty deal. Zero. But then, so then it's the German government, and I'm absolutely with you, it's the German government that leaves the poor people of Raqqa, the poor people on ISIS territory alone, being slaughtered, being raped, being killed, because the German government does not want to have any conflict with Erdogan, does not want to have any conflict with Barzani, and I think this is the basic problem. The Germans are looking for the easy solution, and that is deliver some machine guns to the Peshmerga. So this is just for the good conscience. It won't help at all in the fight against ISIS, but it's so that we don't have to do anything I against Qatar. I think it was Qatar. your former leader in the Bundestag, Gregor Gysi, who said actually sending protest letters to ISIS isn't going to work. You know. It's not going to work, but this uh, is a point where Gregor Gysi had, was really wrong. And you have to know that he is not an expert in the Middle East, so I think um, he respected So your movement's been pretty split on this, haven't you? You've not been, at all. You've been less not than all. united on this. Gregor Gysi said this once, and I think the next day he, he went back and said, no, it's not right to so deliver the So he couldn't make up his mind. So you had a leader who couldn't make up his mind. Change one day and then the next. That's not exactly a great advertisement, is it? It's not. And I think it's not about making up the mind. It's about information. So I think he lacked some kind of information. He got it, and then he realized this is not going to work. The Peshmerga delivering some, some weapons to them, this is just sort of trying to avoid that what really hurts the German government, talking tough, hard talk with Erdogan, hard talk with Barzani, they don't want to do it. So they go the easy route of military support. So what about Hollande, Francois Hollande? He's mm -hmm. been attacked, 129 people killed, more than 300 injured. What's he supposed to do now in order to protect people? Say, I'm, I'm not going to bomb anybody, I'm not going to go to war. Um, there's been an act of war against us, an act of terrorism. I'm just going to put a little pressure on the Arabs. Do you think that's going to make people feel better, make people feel protected? You know, you're asking me what should he have done. And I thought about Stoltenberg in Norway after the Breivik um, massacre. Um, so the first reaction of Stoltenberg was, what we need now is more humanity and more democracy. And I think that was the biggest defeat for the murderers. And I think the, the biggest victory of ISIS was that now everybody is calling them an army, is calling them an act of war. I mean, Hollande, with what he was but saying... But shooting people in public is a pretty violent thing to do, isn't it? If you would let me finish the argument. Yeah. What Hollande did was saying, not murderers, but it's an army. 
So he, he turned just brutal bad murderers into warriors of a foreign state. Why do you do this? This is the, the, the wet dream of the terrorist to, to be called an army of a foreign state. So I think it was a very big mistake and a very big victory. So just deal ISIS. with them with quiet contempt. I think that was in an article that you tweeted from The Guardian. Just deal with them with quiet contempt. That's really going to stop them killing, yeah. isn't it? The point is, don't make them win. And everything they are doing now, going to war, will make them win. Like the Taliban went stronger and stronger and stronger over the years they now to fought in Afghanistan. You make ISIS so stronger just let every them day. Kill. So just let them kill. No. ISIS. Lean back, let them kill, and put a little pressure on the Arabs. Why? To stop funding terrorist groups. Why is it? It doesn't that deal with the problem now, does it? No, it, I'm much faster with what, what I'm suggesting. What I don't understand is that everyone who's opposed to military action, people say he doesn't want to do anything. I have a very clear plan what you could do to stop the foreign fighters, to stop the weapon smuggle, to stop the financial um, support for ISIS. That would work overnight. But Everything that is not military, people always say, you're not doing anything. And I think this is a big mistake. When I grew up here in Germany in the 70s, in the 80s, everybody would have asked, what can you do diplomatically? What could you do economically? What could you do on the borders? But now everybody is just talking about military, and I think this is a big problem we're having here in Germany now. It's what people want. There's, there's wholehearted support for bombing Syria. If you ask people about a uh, German army on foreign soils, it's always 75, 80% of the population against German army on foreign soils. Because You're saying people nobody, know. nobody here wants to see military action against ISIS? The majority of Germans want action against ISIS. Exactly. Action, yeah. but not military. You know, there's this saying we have in Germany that is, for the man with a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And since the last 20 years, since the German foreign policy knows they have the German army at their powers, every problem looks militarily. It's a big mistake. Not every problem is a nail. Let's talk about foreign policy. Let's talk about your party's relationships with Russia, for instance. Excuse whatever the Russians do. No, no, no. This, this is very clear policy I have personally and we as a party. One, it is against international law that um, the Russians took the Krim. It's very clear. It was a very bad behavior. Secondly, it's not an excuse, but you have to see what happened in the past 20 years. And there were things that were wrong on NATO's side. It's not an excuse for, 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 for the mistake of Putin. But if you want to look for a solution, you have to see the whole picture. And part of it is that NATO, against the promises 20 years ago, um, extended far and far into the east to the, to the Russian border. So I think there's it's, it's a point in it to think about it, but not as an excuse. You say that they expanded to the, to the Russian border. NATO flatly rejects this. Um, and Radek Sikorsky, the Polish uh, for, former foreign minister, he said, no NATO bases were ever placed in the new member states. He wrote that last year. Until 2013, no NATO military exercises were ever conducted in Poland, the Baltic states, or anywhere else on the eastern flank. No nuclear installations have been moved to the territory of new member states, even though Russia has them less than 100 kilometers from our border. So, so where is this NATO moving eastwards? Yeah. Don't, you, don't you count these member states as expanding NATO from Germany towards the east border? And now there's, there's further to the east, there are new NATO member states at the border of the Russians against the promise we had that the German reunification, that NATO will not expand eastwards. So who, made, who made that promise? That was the promise in the 2 plus 4 talks by the Americans, by the, by the other Western countries, to the Soviet Union at that time, that NATO will not expand. Who better to talk to about that than Mikhail Gorbachev, who was the leader of the Soviet Union, about broken promises? Um, he was asked directly, October 16th last year, whether NATO had lied about its plans for Eastern Europe, and he replied, the topic of NATO expansion wasn't discussed at all, and it wasn't brought up in those years. I say this with full responsibility. Not a single Eastern European country raised the issue, not even after the Warsaw Pact ceased to exist in 1991. Western leaders didn't bring it up either. And then he added, the agreement on a final settlement with Germany said that no new military structures would be created in the eastern part of the country. No additional troops would be deployed. No weapons of mass destruction would be placed there. And then he added, it has been observed all these years. So your line doesn't hold up. This is the man who knows, yeah. who was there, who had all the top level discussions. He said, 
it has been observed all these years. Did you know that he'd said that? I, I know that Gorbachev said this, uh, but what, what... But you still keep peddling the line that NATO broke its Totally, promises. because you exactly just read it to us, uh, saying that no new military structures. So there's now two interpretations to this. One is no new NATO countries or a totally new structure apart from the NATO. And I think there was an understanding on both sides that it also included no NATO expansion to former uh, Eastern well, Bloc countries. Well, it couldn't have when he says the topic of NATO expansion wasn't discussed at all. That is he saying now, but what is He's in writing, that. but what is in writing in the contract is what you just read to us, no new military where, where structures is this, to this. Where is this contract? You, you just yeah. read it to yeah. us, you just read it to no, us, no new military structures. No, would be in the structures. eastern part of the country, yeah. no new military, and, and they weren't. No, in the eastern I mean, part the, of Germany. The bis big question is whether a new military structure is understood as expansion of the NATO to that part, or whether it's understood as a totally new structure. And yes, there was no new structure built. But I think the understanding by many at the negotiation table was that it means no NATO expansion to the East. That was the understanding. Well, he's and saying that the West observed what it had promised. That is Gorbachev. That's the, yeah, and, and he's in a position one voice. to know. He knows better than both of us, doesn't he? Yes, but because he's one. he was there. But he's one of many. Well, he many. was the top voice in yeah, the Soviet but Union. Still, but still, and he's one of many. you're the man who was actually there. Yeah, but it's just one because view. it's your party line, isn't it? It's not that because NATO of my party. broke its promises. I think the it's West because broke its he it, says they didn't. It was breaking. It was breaking a promise. Didn't. Yeah, one person. One, one I mean, rather important I would be person. Very happy. He's not just the guy you pick out of a crowd. Is I he? would be. I would be very happy if you would always believe the one thing Gorbachev said here and there. No, I think he's one of many persons at that time, and the understanding of many negotiators was. No NATO expansion. You, and you, know Gorbachev you know better than Gorbachev. No, 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 okay. no. There's many people with different voices. And I think and you all make in it. Your party. Isn't it very simple of you just taking one voice, even if it was Gorbachev, but there's others who had a totally different understanding, no? Yeah, but you, you produced this and you peddled this as fact. You put it out that NATO broke its promises. I put it as an absolute fact. NATO yeah. broke its promise because there was this promise of no expansion okay. of NATO. Okay, and Gorbachev says yeah. it, they didn't. All right, let's move on to There's you. a disagreement with let, Gorbachev. Let, let, let's move on to Ukraine then. Yeah. Human rights organizations says evidence human rights violations on both sides. Your leader, Sarah Wagenklech, says the annexation of Crimea has to be accepted after the referendum. Why? when there's all these human rights abuses on Brazil. Why, why accept the referendum? The, the point is, it's wrong. The, exception, uh, the, the, the annexation of Crimea is wrong, and I think everybody agrees on that. It's a violation of international law, and it's wrong. The point is, what do you do now with this situation? Like, um, we think that the, that the uh, creation of Kosovo was also against international law. Yeah, but let's just, but stay, let's no, just no, no. stay with Ukraine for Let the me, moment. No, no, it's, both, it's very similar. No, no. Kosovo why and Crimea is very stay, similar. Why don't we, it's, I think it's not similar, both is inter, uh, against international law, but we have to accept the fact of life. Now there is a Kosovo, and now the, the, the Russian annexed the Crimea, and this is a, a situation we have to live with. If you don't why? accept why? this... That's easy for you to say. It's not easy, but what do you do? Ukraine you doesn't want to live with it. The, the, the president, Poroshenko, said on this program a couple of weeks ago, he's not accepting it. He's he wants not. Crimea back. But what is he doing? What, he what wants can Crimea you do? back. It's a fact Easy of for life. you to say you should give it up. Yeah, but what can you do? I thought you were trying to get away from Cold War mentality. Someone seizes your territory and you just accept it. Exactly. This is like what, what we expected the Russians to accept, that the, the Kosovo just split, split away from Serbia. It's exactly the same situation. It's wrong. But I'm the not West didn't go in and Kosovo. occupy Kosovo, did it? But it, it the didn't West go in and occupy it. The West immediately acknowledged what was the former word of it, acknowledged the state of Kosovo against international law. It's a big It's mistake. very different we from going in and seizing a slice it's of somebody's territory under for yourself. Law, it's exactly the same mistake. And now I'm not going to Kosovo and say, you know, go back to Serbia. It's impossible because it's a fact of life that there's Kosovo. And unfortunately, it's a fact of life that Krim is now part of the Soviet Union. And if you don't want to go back to a Cold War, if you don't go want to go in a hot war with Russia, I think you have to accept this situation. And the lesson we have to learn out of this is start, finally start with a policy towards Russia that is not excluding but including. And that's something that was really the biggest mistake of the world. A hundred countries at the UN General Assembly refused to accept the annexation. You're in good company with the 11 that did, such beacons of 
human rights observance as North Korea, Belarus, Zimbabwe, Cuba. Are you happy to be on their side over this? Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> because you are. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes I'm even having Hundred political positions. Hundred countries didn't buy this nonsense, did they? But you do. And what are they doing about it? What do you want them to do about no, it? No, what are they doing? I'm asking you. No, what but are I they mean, doing they, about they, they put a, a line in the dust that you're not even prepared to say that uh, this should be battled, this should be uh, fought, this should be... Who's battling uh, it? Who's fighting it? Nobody. The, the Washington accepted it, London accepted it, Berlin accepted it, everybody accepted it that this is now a fact of life. Nobody's doing anything against it. But you're going to accept this illegal act anyway. Like London, like Washington, like Paris, like Berlin. I thought you were in opposition. I thought you had something different to offer. You don't, here, do you? Here, I totally, you don't. Here, you don't. I totally agree with my government you that don't. there's no okay. point in fighting for the Krim anymore. No, no opposition there. On this point, why? I'm not in opposition just for the for the fun of well, it. Was it so? Was it so wrong for Ukraine to want to join the European Union? Something that um, Putin had accepted way back in 2004 when he said, "If Ukraine wants to join the EU and if the EU accepts Ukraine as a member, Russia, I think, would welcome this because we have a special relationship with Ukraine." He gave it the green light. So what was so wrong in what Ukraine happened is joining the, the EU? What you were just reading was, I think, from 2004, 2005. It was 2004, December exactly. the 10th. Yeah. So what happened in, in the years thereafter is that suddenly there was a fight from the European Union on the one side, from the Russian government on the other side, on the dominance in Ukraine. I think this fight was a mistake from both sides. I'm talking about Brussels, I'm talking about Moscow. It was a big fight and it was a big mistake because at the end of the day, this turned into a very heated awful process in, in Kiev, in the Ukraine, because this government was torn between the two powers. It was a big mistake of both parts to force Ukraine into this bloody civil war. And what I think both sides could What happened is that Putin changed his policies both at home and abroad. He started to crack down on civil society. He started to see enemies everywhere. He changed. Ukraine and didn't. And what's the point? I mean, European Union is also changing. Point is, so, so what is so wrong for Ukraine to want to join? the EU. And, and why should people in your party be saying, well, we have to accept that Russia has its spheres of influence? But you also have to accept that within the Ukraine... This is a cold, cold War idea, the spheres of influence, isn't it? You also have to accept that within the Ukraine, there were also both powers. Those who were leaning more towards the West, those who were leaning more towards the East. And everybody knew if we lean towards one side, we will be losing on the other side. So it was a very bad choice for the Ukrainian people. And I think both are to blame, Moscow and Brussels, to put the Ukrainian people before this choice. This was the biggest mistake. Why accept, come back to the question, why accept the Cold War dictates that Russia can dictate to the countries around it who they can join, what they can join, who they want to be. Why do you accept that? It's not a dictate, neither from the yes. European Union. The European Union wanted very hard this special agreement with Ukraine. Russia wanted very hard their point of it. I think it was equally bad from both sides. And now trying to say this is Cold War thinking and their sphere of influence. No, this is very but Russia's very made it clear. It is our sphere of influence. Interest. Russia's made that clear. It's, it wants a 100% guarantee that Ukraine will not join NATO. It hasn't got a right to that, has it? Sure, sure. Because Russia is a military threat. If you look at the past 15 years of actions of NATO against Russia, if you look Are at Are you saying Russia has the right to say to Ukraine, you can't join NATO? Are you saying that? Yes. I can, I can Despite say... Despite the fact I that can it's say signed... To London, I can say... I, the Jan Van Aken, agreement. I, Jan van Aken, can say to the British government, I don't want you to join NATO or the Warsaw Pact or whatever. I always have the right to say this. No, it's What's demanding. It? Russia is demanding that Very Ukraine fine. doesn't join NATO. And you that's can, okay you by you. You can always ask, you can always that's ask okay another government you. to do things or not. And you want to accept that? I'm always fine. I mean, the, the, it's fine. the, the French government can ask the German no, no, government no, let's to do just, this or this. Stop muddying the waters. We're just talking about this particular incident. I'm asking you a straight question. Does Russia, do you think, have the right to tell Ukraine what it can join and what it can't? It has absolutely the right to say what they want, what they don't want. Like the That's EU. not answering my question. I am answering Does your question. Does it have the right, no, yes or you're no? You're playing words here. This no, is unfair no, to, you're to the one who's playing speaker. words. You're playing words here. Does so it I'm have the right? You're, you're prepared to accept that, yes, aren't you? The European Union has the right to have specific wishes towards the Ukrainian government. They have a specific interest and they can voice them. And Moscow can do the same. So you lie down and accept whatever Moscow wants. 
Or that's, you lay, that's what comes down from And this, you lay it? down and accept whatever Brussels want. This is not right. I think the Ukrainian people have the right for their own Well, way. I don't, because I don't represent anybody. Yeah, but Brussels. You're taking I represent the side Brussels. Brussels. Yeah. No, I'm not. I'm just taking no. it aside. I'm trying to get a straight answer to a straight question. And the, straight answer, is, the straight answer is everybody has the right to say what they would like to have, but everybody has the obligation, and this goes towards Brussels and the European Union and Moscow, to open the space for the Ukrainian people to find a way that is not giving them lose on one side, win on the other side. And this pressure from both sides were equally, equally bad. I'm not saying it was good from Moscow, I'm not, not saying it was good from Brussels. And there's no distinction for me here. They would argue about this moral equivalence that you bring in. Jan van Aken, good to have you on Conflict Zone. Thank you very much. Thank you.